Amen. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much, uh, as the song just said, for the price that you paid for us. A price that cost you everything, and it gave, and it gave us everything, salvation, eternal life the chance to live in harmony with you. And that's why we're here to worship you, O oh Lord. Not only because we get to give ourselves to you, but, be, but because we also get to receive from you who you are through Jesus Christ by the power of your Holy Spirit. And so during this time of preaching now, we turn to you in hopeful expectation that you would meet us through the word that's preached by your Holy Spirit. Open up our ears so that we can hear, our eyes to see, and give us hearts that can understand and make us willing to do your will. For Jesus' sake and for our salvation, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, today begins a new sermon series. We were supposed to return to our series in Acts today. Um, some of you probably forgot that we were even doing a sermon series from Acts, but we were. Way back in October, we took a break for the pledge campaign, and then there's so many different disruptions, but we'll get to Acts one day. We'll get to Acts again one day, but in the meantime, uh, we thought that it was important to do a series on hearing God. And the reason for that is, uh, in, in one of our recent accountable leadership team meetings, as we were, discuss as we were discussing the state of the church and uh, what things are happening in the church, and not only friendship, but kind of around the world, uh, church decline, et cetera, we began asking the question, like, what should we do in light of decline uh, financially, attendance, uh, mission opportunities, et cetera, what are some things that we can do to make sure that Friendship United Methodist Church is continuing to serve the community and to bear witness to the reality of Jesus Christ in the community through who we are and through what we do? Well, after a, a few moments of conversation, uh, we decided that we're gonna enter into a season of prayer and just ask God to reveal to us uh, what plans God has for us and what direction we should go in. And you know, when we talked about that, one of the members of the group said, uh, how, will, how will we be able to discern whether or not God is speaking to us? That's a pretty good question, right? Because I may come back and said, guys, the Lord spoke to me. Here's what we should do buy me a Tesla, and then that will enable church growth to happen, right? So it's a very important question, and, and we've seen, unfortunately, throughout church history that Christian leaders have manipulated uh, people and progress by saying, the Lord told me, or the Lord spoke to me. So it's a very good question. How will we be able to discern whether or not God is guiding us? And it's not just for manipulative reasons, but Truthfully, if we're praying for the Lord's guidance, how will you know that the thought, the idea, the suggestion, especially if it's a group, how will you know if that is from uh, the Lord? And I think we've all asked these kinds of questions, yeah? Especially those of us who've entered into times of prayer for big decisions or small decisions, we've all wondered, well, how am I gonna know what God says, if God says anything at all? How will I know? You know, most studies reveal, and I found this fascinating, most studies reveal that most people, including atheists, will pray or will talk to God or will ask questions to God. But those same studies reveal that most people, including Christians, struggle identifying when God is talking to them. So the question, how will we be able to discern, is a very important question. And one of, the, one of the reasons is, um, well, one of the questions that I ask, like, why is it that we all confidently speak to God, even those of us who would say we don't believe in God, why is it that we speak to God, and then on the flip side, we can't confidently identify when God is speaking to us? And I think there's several possible reasons for that, and I'd like to suggest uh, to you this morning that the main reason, I think, is because many people haven't been trained to develop the kind of life, not just the kind of ears or receptors, but many people haven't been trained to develop the kind of life that would enable them to know and discern when God is speaking to them. 
And so in this four-part series, I'd like to explore how to have such a life. And it's very important that I'm using the word life. A lot of times, books on prayer will focus on mechanics and things you ought to do, prayers you ought to pray, and ways to tune your ears. All those things are important, but we have to understand that the main question of when it comes to God speaking to us is, am I the kind of person that can hear God speaking uh, to me? And so my approach for this series will, and at least I'm going to do my best to take a non-religious approach, because we're talking about our lives here. We're not just talking about our Sunday morning. God is interested in our lives outside of Sunday morning, as well as he's interested in our lives in Sunday morning. And conversing with God has to be about all of life, because if it's If conversing with God isn't about the entirety of our lives, then we're not really going to have much to say to God. I may go to God and say, what should I preach about this Sunday? What songs should we sing? When should the prayer service be? But if I can't also go to God about all the other areas of my life, including recreation and vacation and family and finance, then my conversational relationship with God isn't going to amount to much of anything. So it's important to understand through this series, God wants to speak to you about your life. And that's why the series is titled what it is, A Listening Life, A Listening Life. You know, a few years ago, and this is where I got this title from, a few years ago, uh, some of you remember when uh, me and my family went on sabbatical. And my first stop during the sabbatical was to the Gethsemane Monastery in Kentucky. And I spent a few days there. It was a wonderful experience, uh, primarily because this is a monastery that's all about spending time in in solitude and silence. You walk around the entire place and you don't hear people chit-chatting. You don't hear phones ringing. The place is as quiet as possible. And even communal moments where you're used to having conversations with people, these moments are silent. So during lunch, instead of sitting down with a someone and saying, hey, where'd where'd you come from? Or what do you do? All the stuff that we do to make small talk. Most people sat in silence. And a benefit of the sitting in silence is you become aware of things that normally you just walk past, right? And so while I was there sitting in silence, I walked around a little bit. And when I got done eating, I noticed a sign on the wall. And I went up to read the sign. And this is what it said. In fact, I'd like for us to read this together. So let's read this quote from Thomas Merton together. Ready? My life is a listening. His is a speaking. My salvation is to hear and respond. For this, my life must be silent. If our life is poured out in useless words, we will never hear anything. We will never become anything. My life is a listening, and his the speaking. What must a person believe for this quote to be true? Not only Thomas Merton, but if you were going to believe this quote, my life is a listening, his is the speaking. My salvation is to hear and respond. For this, my life must be silent. If our life is poured out in useless words, we'll never hear anything. We'll never become anything. What must one believe about God for this to be true? Just shout some stuff out. That God likes to talk to us. That God wants to talk to us, right? That's very, I mean, that's kind of glaring, isn't it? God, one must believe that, first of all, there's a God who speaks, and more specifically, that there's a God who wants to speak to humans. Now, this seems like a small thing, but it turns out to be a big hindrance in communication with God, a huge hindrance for people. You know, why is that a big hindrance for people? What kind of God uh, does the lack of this belief leave us with? And this is the predominant belief that if you were to ask most people, this is the predominant belief that most people have about God, the kind of God that most people Uh, believe in is a God that's distant, right? A God that's impersonal, maybe too busy, you know, too absorbed with important matters. You know, that's the kind of God that we believe in. He's an unknowable, 
impassable, too busy certainly to be bothered with my own affairs. That's the kind of God that has made uh, its way into our conscience. And where do these ideas come from? Well, from several places, but primarily these ideas, uh, many of them come from our own relationships with human authority figures, right? Because if you look at human authority figures, how are they characterized? Well, many of them are distant, inaccessible. You know, we, we certainly don't have uh, accessibility with many people that we would consider uh, great, right? And so what happens is we take our ideas of what it means to be great, and we look at humans that are great, or humans that are powerful, or humans that are authority figures, and we take their characteristics, and then we move them over and place them over God. And so since we consider our presidents to be great, how strange would it be if, like on the president's birthday, all of us sent him a text message? You know, all of us was like, hey, hey, Joe, happy birthday, man. And then he responded, hey, thanks so much for thinking about me. We'd be like, what are you, what are you doing, you know? You shouldn't be able to respond to me. You're supposed to be busy doing other things. How weird would it be if our, our favorite Hollywood actors or actresses, we, man, just came back from seeing your movie. It was fantastic. And then they responded, oh man, thank you so much. I'm glad you liked it, you know? That would be weird. We have an expectation that those who we consider great should be inaccessible to us. That's why we don't think it's strange when we see a famous person or a powerful person walking around with security guards. We understand the security is there to keep people like me away from them because they're great, they're important, you know? And, and, and that's normal to us. We don't think it's strange. Now, it'd be strange if all of a sudden you saw me walking up and down Springfield Pike and I had four security guards around me. You'd be like, who do, who do you think you are? You know what I mean? Who do you think you are, Meshach? Because the human concepts of great don't apply to me, but they apply to some people. And when they apply, characteristics of I can't get close to them. And sadly, that's what we do with God. We place those characteristics. I can't talk to him. He's not interested in me. He's inaccessible. And that's okay. We begin to believe that. But it's important for us to understand that God's greatness is different. God's greatness is different than human greatness. God's greatness is not like human greatness because human greatness limits accessibility, right? Human greatness limits our connection with the people, but God's greatness increases accessibility. His greatness does the exact opposite. I was just reading a, a science fiction book, I think it's called um, Expeditionary Force. It's one of these I don't know why I get sucked into these books about outer space and aliens, but, you know, Amazon keeps on saying, I think you'd enjoy it. And stupidly, I say, you know what, maybe I will enjoy it. And in this case, I did enjoy it. But on, on, uh, in this book, uh, the main character discovers uh, an alien uh, artificial intelligence that has been alive for millions of years. And in one part of the book, near the end, the, the AI says to him, uh, I want you to speak faster. You speak so slowly. I comprehend so fast and so immensely that to hear you speak slowly, it's like agonizing to me. And so the human says, well, you know what? Why don't you get on the internet? Then you can speak to everyone on planet Earth at the same time. And the AI said, that's brilliant. And so all night long, he got on the internet and he talked to everybody on Instagram and Twitter, et cetera. His greatness increased his accessibility. He couldn't just talk to one person at one time, but he could talk to everybody at one time. Now, in a personal way, in a personable way, that's what God is like. God has the capacity to speak to everybody at the same time. His greatness doesn't make him less accessible, his greatness makes him more accessible. And how do we know this is true? How do we know that God's greatness makes him more accessible? The Bible, by looking in the Bible. If you look in the Bible, 
you'll see that God routinely has conversations with people who, in the human scale, are nobodies. And you should read it like that. You should learn to read the Bible and think the thought, Peter was just like me. In fact, isn't that what it says about Elijah in the book of James? Elijah was a human being just like you. That's, that's a thought you should think. Every time you're tempted to think that uh, Elijah was this great man of God, this great prophet, or Peter was such a devout individual, or the apostle Paul had something special about him, you should think the thought, he's just a normal person. Mary was just some girl that God chose. Nothing inherently special about her. Nothing that she had that you didn't have. And yet the creator of the universe swoops down to speak. So we see those figures I just mentioned. Some of you may remember uh, the character Hagar. Does anyone remember Hagar? Hagar, the servant of, uh, of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Remember when Sarah was like, I need her out of the house, and Abraham said, listen, I'm not getting between you. You guys do whatever you think is right. And so Sarah sends Hagar and her newborn child into the wilderness to fend for themselves. And just when they're about to die of thirst, God speaks to a little slave girl, a nobody. It happens time and time again. The first time we encounter God speaking with people in the, in the Bible, what's he doing? He's literally walking in the garden with two human beings, just chit-chatting, just having a conversation, speaking with Moses conversationally, face-to-face. -face, and the Bible says face-to-face -face as a person speaks to their friend. God's greatness makes him more accessible. It, it increases his, his accessibility. We must believe that about God, that the God of the universe that created everything desires to speak with me. He's available. I have his contact information, as it were, and he has mine. And inasmuch as I want to reach out to him, I can believe that he wants to reach out to me even more. This is the first requirement for having a conversational relationship with God. We must believe this about God's greatness. You must believe this about God's greatness. You must believe that God is actually interested in talking to you. You gotta believe that. You gotta believe that. Remove yourself out of the picture because oftentimes we think I don't have an interesting life, right? But if we consider who God is, our Father, he's interested. None of your kids probably had interesting lives, right? but you are interested in them. Why? Because they're your children. This is why it was so revolutionary for Jesus to come and begin teaching people to address God, not as almighty, not as all these powerful terms, but Father. When you pray, he said to his students, say Father. Now, oftentimes we rush past that, right? When we're doing the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and we just kind of rush past. And we place more emphasis on the parts of that prayer that where it seems like something is happening. Hallowed be thy name. It seems like something's happening there. But I'd encourage you the next time you pray to stop at our Father and meditate on what would it be like if I believed that I was a child of God, that God was my Father. How would my life be different? How would my life be different today? Revolutionary what Jesus did. When you pray, address God as Father. See God as your Father and see yourself as a daughter of God, as a child of God. What would change in your life if you really believed that God were your Father? Next time you say that prayer, stop right there and take a few moments to just think about it. That's what God wants you to think about him. Father, Father. Well, let's return to that quote real quick. What would you have to believe about yourself for this to be true? My life is a listening, his is a speaking. My salvation is to hear and respond. For this, my life must be silent. 
if our life is poured out in useless words, we'll never hear anything, we'll never become anything. What must you believe about yourself and about your life for this to be true? What do you think? That you're worthy. All right, what else? Say it again. That you matter to God. All right? That he wants to guide us. You got to believe this. You have to believe this about yourself. Listening for God and responding faithfully, you have to believe this is the most reliable way to live. This is the way of salvation. And what does salvation mean? Some of you may have seen um, sometime uh, last week, Stephen Colbert, and this is a bit of an aside, but Stephen Colbert uh, was interviewing uh, an artist named Dua Lipa, and she asked him a question about his faith and his comedy. And I tell you, man, sometimes I'm just embarrassed by uh, Christians and the way they respond to things. Stephen Colbert gave an excellent response about how his faith intersects with his life. And a bunch of Christians, even professors and theologians said, why didn't he share the gospel with her? Why didn't he talk about salvation? And they couldn't see that his answer was dripping with salvation. Because what is salvation? It's not going to heaven when you die. That's just the fruits of salvation. Salvation is a flourishing life right now. So salvation happens when you integrate the life of God into your current life right now. And that's the answer that he gave. If you haven't seen it, I'd encourage you to take a, a listen to what he had to say and, and, and ask yourself, how would I respond to this question about how my, my life as an engineer integrates with my, or intersects with my faith in God? But everyone that was responding was getting so upset, saying he had such a prime opportunity to share the gospel and talk about salvation. And what they meant was by, by telling her, well, you know, Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, then he was resurrected, so if I believe in him, I can go to heaven when, when I die. But since he didn't mention any of those things, they thought he wasn't talking about salvation. But if they would come, and if we would come to see that salvation, when the Bible speaks about salvation, as I've said over and over and over again, what it's talking about is my life right now, flourishing, me living well, me living a good life, the good life. Then we'd understand why I must believe that it's important for me to hear God's voice, because God is interested in me having a flourishing life. And if God's interested in me having a flourishing life, then I must be interested in hearing what God has to say because he's going to lead me and guide me in a way that leads to a life that flourishes. And this tends to be problematic, right? Because of our, our definition of salvation. Our definition is sometimes at odds with God's definition. We pray so much. It's I love Dallas Willard's quote. He says, uh, it's funny that many Christians believe that God will get them into heaven when they die, but they don't believe that the same God can provide lunch when they're hungry. Our views of salvation are backwards. And so we equate the power of God to be immensely powerful to rescue and redeem my soul from the pit of hell. But if I have a daily need like patience, then God's insufficient. We need to flip it on its head. So sometimes we're at odds. And other times, you know, if we're going to be honest, other times we're at odds because our definition of salvation contrasts with God's definition of salvation. And we know that. And so we don't necessarily want to hear what God has to say to us today right? It's like that quote that people always use, it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. When is that normally said? When does someone normally say that? Usually when they know that what the other person's going to say, no. right, they're, they're not going to want you to do whatever you're going to do. And so we say, well, you know, it's better to ask for, uh, for forgiveness instead of permission. 
Not so with God. Not so with God. Because the Bible clearly says that the way of the transgressor leads to destruction. And so any way that we walk that's in opposition to God, even if it's filled with joy and goodness at the beginning, you can bet down the road it's going to lead to destruction. But sometimes we want the beginning of it, the beginning pleasure, like the prodigal son. Remember the prodigal son? No one can deny that this brother did not have a great time when he left his father's house. He would have, I mean, the way our TV programming is, he would have got a, a TV deal. Let me tell you about my time in the far country. Filled with pleasure, right? But where'd he end up? Destruction, the pigsty. Trying to eat the food that pigs were eating. And that's what happens when any of us hear the word of God, we see God's salvation isn't as pleasurable as my idea of salvation. And knowing that, we don't want to hear the word of God. We don't want to hear what God has to say. The voice of God might be an unwelcome intrusion in our plans. And so rather than wanting to hear God, we just kind of close our ears to what God might say to us. And so we orient our lives to only hear from God when it benefits us personally. Has anybody done that without raising your hand? Has anyone done that before? You seek to hear God when you know it's going to benefit you personally? I did that when, back in 2003. 2003. In January, I got a call saying, hey, the unit's been activated. You're going to war. I wore my Bible out for the next few months. I mean, I was always in communication with God. Why? Because I didn't want to die. <laughs> I wanted to make it back home alive. So my prayer life went up big time. My Bible, in fact, amongst my fellow Marines, I got a reputation. But this is before I felt like I was called to ministry as the preacher man. Because I, I always had my little green Bible in my little cargo pockets. Always, always praying, always talking about God. I remember the day I came back, that Bible went into my closet. Don't need God anymore. I'm back stateside. Now I can do whatever I want. This is no way to develop a listening life. It treats God like a cosmic insurance policy that's only necessary when trouble arises. It doesn't take into consideration God's feelings. Did you know that God had feelings? Sometimes we think that God is so powerful that he just can't be bothered. Whatever we do, it's not gonna it's not going to hurt God. God is the most feeling being in the universe. The most, not the least, the most. God wants to be wanted. Did you know that? God wants to be wanted. And God's not going to show up where he isn't wanted. Would you show up where you're not wanted? Suppose you got an invitation to a party, and then you heard someone saying, my mom said I should invite her. Would you show up there knowing that you weren't really wanted? I wouldn't, and God wouldn't. You want to know why many people don't hear from God? Because God knows they don't really want me. They just want me to deliver them from their trouble, but they don't want me. There's a story of, and Ashanti and I were talking about um, teaching, and I, it reminded me of the story of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was teaching a class of Sunday school kids, and the majority of them were unruly. They did not want to be there. So he just kind of sat up front and started speaking in a low voice to those who wanted to be there. 
And those who wanted to learn, they came close. They drew close so they could hear him. Those who didn't want to learn, they stayed in the back and did their own thing. We're going to talk about this in a, in a future sermon. That's why God whispers. That's why the still, small voice. That's why God doesn't shout. You know, I mean, if God wanted to shout to get our attention, God could shout. But God loves us so much that he wants us to retain our freedom to choose him. And so instead, he whispers. Instead of saying, Meshach! <laughs> he says, And, and as he whispers, what will it require me to do? I have to quiet myself, and I have to listen. My life is a listening. His is a speaking. I have to have a listening life if I'm going to experience the human flourishing that comes by listening and responding faithfully to what God has to say. This means believing that God is interested above all in your life. Which is why when God came in the person of Jesus, he didn't spend time with those who didn't want to be with him. You ever notice that, how easy it was for Jesus to just let people go? The rich young ruler came with all his credentials, any pastor's best friend. He walks in the door and he says, hey, forget about all that operating budget stuff. I'm here. And most pastors would be like, well, you know what? You ever been a deacon before? Have you ever been uh, the, the chairperson of the accountable leadership team? Why don't you come and you can help us with all of our decision making? But Jesus just kind of, you know, you don't want to be with me, then go on and be about your business. The Bible says he went away sad and Jesus did not chase him but he let him go. But to those who did want to be with Jesus, Jesus poured himself into them and they received from him salvation. And that's the invitation still today, that for those who are called by God and who hear and respond faithfully, God pours himself into them and they receive from him salvation not just going to heaven when they die. I still firmly believe that most people are going to go to heaven when they die. I think the only people who won't go to heaven when they die are those who are hell-bent against it. But the majority of people, I think, are going to go to heaven when they die. But who's going to experience heaven here right now? The listeners. Those who listen. Those who quiet their soul. You know, when, when me and a few, and I know I'm preaching long today, forgive me, but when, whenever I get amongst a group of pastors and we talk about uh, our visitations to people's homes or to hospital rooms, it's astounding that the TV is on in hospital rooms when people are supposed to be recovering. Turn that nonsense off and be quiet and listen. Our lives are so noisy. It's, it's astounding that we can't hear from God. There's so many competing things. How could we hear from God? The story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember what King Nebuchadnezzar did to them? When I play the sound of the lyre and the timber and the harp and the electric guitar and the this and the that, when you hear all that, that noise, then you bow down. And you would think that the creator of heaven and earth would say, I got to compete with all that noise. So turn the bass up. Or you'd think God would tell the AV crew, turn the bass up so they can hear me. But instead, God comes in, Tyler, Matthew, Michael, Jennifer. He whispers, the noisier it gets, says the Lord, the quieter I'll speak. Why? Because I want to teach you to have a listening life. A listening life. So that's what the sermon series is going to be about. How can we have a listening life? How can we have a listening life? 
How can we have the kind of life that experiences God's salvation as we listen to his word? These are two things I'd like you guys to take away uh, today. And I, I'd actually like to, and I, you know, I apologize to the musicians. You guys practice so much during the week. I apologize, but I'm, I'm kind of sensing that we should uh, end the service a little bit different uh, today, okay? So instead of communion even, please, you can either take your communion home with you or put it back on the table. But instead of doing that for the next um, four minutes, and this may get awkward and uncomfortable, I just like us to be quiet. Okay, then I'll come and do announcements and the choir will lead us in one more song and then we'll be dismissed. Okay, so let's just take some time to quiet ourselves and listen and pay attention to what's happening inside of you. I'll say a prayer then we'll begin. Heavenly Father, you come to us in the stillness Drop thy still dews of quietness till all our striving cease. Take from our souls the strain and stress and let our ordered lives profess the goodness of thy, of thy peace. Speak through the winds of our desires thy coolness and thy balm. Let sense be dumb, let flesh retire. Speak through the earthquake, wind, and fire. O oh, still small voice of calm. Let's listen to what God has to say to us. Heavenly Father, in such a noisy world, we want to hear from you. Many of our lives have been trained to respond to noise and busyness. And so in a very strange way, quiet and silence is agitating to us. Send your Holy Spirit, O oh Lord, not to make us monastic, we weren't called to that but to give us the kind of lives that seek the quiet to hear your voice, 
even in the midst of the noise. Teach us by the power of your Holy Spirit to quiet our lives. And as our lives quiet, O oh God, we pray that like Elijah on the mountain, you would help us recognize your still small voice coming to us with salvation wrapped amidst all of the words you bring. Do this for Jesus' sake and for our salvation. Amen. Amen. Was that uncomfortable? It was for me a little bit, and I'm not even going to lie. It was for me. That's a sign that it's necessary. <laughs>